on camera. Today is July 14th, 2017. My name is Tony Hilliard. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center and with me is Sue Verhoff, the History Center's Director of Oral History and Genealogy. We're at the USO in Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson Airport today to record the oral history of Mary Lou Austin, the President and CEO of the US Count USO Council of Georgia. Mary Lou has served with the United Services Organization here in the U.S., overseas in the Middle East during Operation Enduring Freedom and uh, assisted uh, in providing support to the thousands of servicemen coming through Atlanta, uh, returning to the United States for R&R. Ms. Austin's oral history is being recorded for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. We're honored to have you with us today, Mary Lou, and thanks for participating in the project. Would you begin by telling us your full name and where you live? Well, sure. First of all, thank you, and I'm honored to be doing this, to even be asked to do this. I'm Mary Lou Austin, and I live in Sandy Springs, Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about your early life? Sure. I have to think back that far. But, you know, I was raised in, I would say, a middle class family. No brothers, only had two sisters. Did not have a lot of people that were even associated with the military. Oh, I did have a couple of cousins. And so I was really not around a military lifestyle, so to speak. And went on to high school, then went on to college. And I started teaching school in uh, Washington, D.C. Just really was not my bag at, at that time. And it's so interesting now when I'm thinking back, you see about your early life. So it was, the, when I was in Washington, it was the height of the Vietnam War and there were protests and people were going to the Pentagon, et cetera. And I just really couldn't understand it because at the same time, I was young, I was single. I was dating a lot in Washington, DC. There were servicemen in, coming from Quantico, from Fort Belvoir, from Bowling Air Force Base. And we used to belong to this organization called Junior Officers and Professional Associations. And there was a dance every Friday and Saturday night. And naturally you would meet all these young servicemen and then date them and then off they would go and sometimes you know I really really wonder you know what would happen to them but I was looking for, for a career change and as I said I was I was really thinking about those that protested and I thought wow I love the country I had spent some summers in Washington I was a congressional intern so okay. I got to feel very patriotic in the love of our country so at the same time you know it was interesting I thought today I was being recruited to join the women's army. And in fact, the woman came and she was a graduate of my college. And she said, oh, you would just really, really like it. I think it would be really good for you. And the thing that stuck in my mind, and she goes, what do you think about the army? And I was thinking about, oh, you know, it's just only knowing the paper. Oh, you have to go and do grunt work and everything. She goes, oh no, when you'd be an officer, they would make your bed for you. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and so, but then it was that, and the USO was re recruiting me. I saw an ad in the paper one day and it said USO needs um, social workers, recreational workers, please contact. And again, being in Washington, D.C., I naturally thought it was a government agency. But I called up and it had all these six stars and six agencies listed. And I said, you know, I'm, I saw your ad, you know, is it a government? Oh, no, no, come on in. And I went in for an interview and I found out it was a not-for-profit. It was a charity, even though it was all red, white, and blue, and its only mission were to serve servicemen, military men, and I'm putting women in now in the service and their families. So I was kind of intrigued and so I went for an interview and they called me back and they said, you know, we have some positions for Vietnam. And I just wasn't ready at that time to think that, oh, I'm going to make a big jump. And of course, my family was all aghast, you know. And so I said, no, thank you. Well, they called back about a month later and said, we have a number of positions in the States. Would you consider that? And so I said, sure. So that began my job, my position, my career, which I now think is a, a mission field because it became a lifestyle. And uh, I'm so proud to really represent the organization, United Service Organization. So I began in Washington, D.C. I trained in Jacksonville, North Carolina, went on to my first assignment, Biloxi, Mississippi, and Gulfstream, where I had Air Force personnel and 
the Seabees, and then on to Chicago, and of course the Navy, and then on to Germany, and uh, where I met my husband, and I have to say a Vietnam veteran who should really be doing, doing this, a um, um, Bronze Star. Uh, he's a retired career military officer. And so I, at some point in my life, I thought that perhaps it was ended and then we came back to the States and then they said, no, uh, we have a problem in Atlanta. So we're wondering if you could go down there and check it out and see what can happen. So I did and I'm still here. So I either did not solve the problem or I'm part of the problem, but it has been just a number of almost 40 years here in Atlanta. So I've been with the organization almost 49 years now. So it is a life. It's a lifestyle. Our son was born into it. He always thought your mother went out and drove tanks or was on the, he was on the, the front lines with me for the first Gulf War, given when the troops were deploying out of Dobbins, he was there. And uh, I was going through some pictures recently. He's about to get married this, this year. And I was thinking for his, um, you know, rehearsal dinner, and there he is dressed in camo over at Fort McPherson. So uh, he's a Citadel grad, but he's not because of uh, physical, is not in the service. But, you know, my father-in-law, my husband's father was a retired military officer. So it came to that. Many people say to me, oh, you're in USO and you're in your career because of your family. No, but I met my husband and had a family because of USO and it's all about serving the men and women. It, I've got to see that you know the military is its own culture, its own lifestyle, but when you really get down to it, it's that young man or young woman from your hometown that is serving somewhere else, doing a job maybe that no one else wanted to do. And you know, they don't get the respect, they, they have to take a lot of grime and gut, but USO is there for them. And that's what we are. As I said, we're a charity. We provide support, all types of support from entertainment to job transition assistance to supporting military families. Right now we're doing a drive for some of the military families at Fort Benning that need school supplies. Our USOs in Georgia are fantastic. I start with a brand new one that we're going to uh, be doing a ribbon cutting for at Fort Stewart and Hunter on the airfield. Our USO Savannah operation. Uh, we're in USO at Warner Robins. But mostly our USO here at Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International Airport is really, you know, you name it, everybody knows of it because of the fact that the thousands, now millions, have come through, especially during Operation r and &R. This was the only flight, this, this is where they came in. They came with their families. We were down there, our wonderful USO volunteers. I'm especially proud of our volunteers from the Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association, our number one and longest serving volunteer group there to meet them and they see what happens when the families come and reunite, but they're also there to lend a helping hand, a pat on the back when it was time for that serviceman or that servicewoman to go back to leave their family. And the USO was actually the refuge for both, for both those that were departing and for the families that were waiting behind. And that's what we are, we're the families, you know, on the home front, and that's what USO does. And I can't talk enough about our volunteers because they are the lifeblood of USO. They represent every type of job, every type of culture, it's such diverse, diverse core of individuals that want to show appreciation for the men and women that have, you know, served in, in our country. And I particularly give a big hand out to the Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association because they knew that they did not get the welcome home that when they came back. Uh, I've heard stories of being spit on, of, you know, being, you know, uh, attacked. And, you know, I say that I was not really involved in all of that or had that happen to me. But when I was in Chicago, our USO was attacked. Our windows were broken really? because it was in, you know, it was early 70s, right. you know, peace demonstrations and just couldn't, you know, uh, belong. And the USO was a refuge. And I was glad that I was there to 
support and to lead the volunteers for providing that support because it was a very, very tough time. It was. Let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. you, you indicated, uh, where was your first duty station, if you will? Uh, my first permanent duty station was Biloxi, Mississippi, which was destroyed with Hurricane Camille. And it was a beautiful USO. Uh, we're now back down there in um, Gulf, the, the Gulf down there. Well, what what Gulf were the Park. kinds of things you had to do to begin when you first started? Well, first of all, you had to take a lot of training and orientation. You say you got your training in Jacksonville, North Carolina? Well, we stopped in Jacksonville, North Carolina, which at the time was the oldest, and I think it's still the most continuously operating USO Maybe. Center. Gigantic hall, a lot of pool tables, and Marines, Marines after Marines after Marines. 24 hours those pool tables were, were, were going. And that, at that time, that's what it was. It was recreation to get their minds off. Again, remember, they were going to be deploying very soon. And so you had volunteers, you had the, the wonderful homemade goodies, you had the, uh, the lunches for them and the buffets to let them know. And you were sort of mothering them too and you know just making sure. And of course we had recreational dances. Now when I started with USO, <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever been to USO, but there used to be USO dances and they were called junior volunteers. And they were very regulated. The, the young ladies, 18 to 24, I believe they were, they had to go in and take, you know, take, uh, we had to take applications and train them. And I remember in Chicago, I had a large, large group of them. They had to come and we had to check, you know, their dresses because at the time, mini skirts and hot pants were coming around. And I I mean, some of our older chaperones were really having, you know, a time. And don't forget, these were young men. They would get off in Chicago. They would get off that train from Great Lakes and they would run to the USO because they knew there was a Saturday night dance and they were going to have a wonderful meal. And so these were, you know, these were part of the things that we did. But, you know, basically I had to make sure that I could organize, you know, also be a chaperone, also provide the funding. Remember, we're not a government agency. We had to get funding, and funding was tough during some of those years. Really, I would say funding was very difficult until the early 90s, because what happened after Vietnam? We had that law, we had that disdain. Even here in Atlanta, when it came, they just funded, if there was such a thing, they were not going to fund USO anymore. They didn't think it was relevant. The military was going away. Everybody had a bad feeling about, you know, the soldiers, etc. Even though we had Fort McPherson right here, but Fort McPherson was a headquarters post. Most of those people traveled. It was the head for forces command. So it was difficult. And then, you know, the one thing that came about, I would say in 89, 90 with the first Gulf War, what happened? We called up the reserves. And what happened? You called up your neighbor, you called up your son or daughter's school teacher, and all of a sudden you realize people serving in the military, they were not those killers that they had been portrayed to be. They were people, your neighbors, your mm -hmm. community, the people from your church, and they were going off to defend your country and they were called up. And so I think that to me was a big turning point. I saw a lot more people wanting to get involved. And again, uh, if you may recall when the Fort Campbell troops came through Atlanta to go on to, to uh, Savannah to you know, get on the, the ships, people had banners hanging over the overpasses, welcome. They bivouacked over at Fort Gordon one night. We had pizzas coming in where we used a gym. It was just a uh, I hadn't seen that in a, a while. I think perhaps that was the first time I saw some true appreciation for our servicemen and service women. So, you know, that went on and, you know, different things in, in Germany. It was, you know, there were a lot of families. There were troops that were living in the barracks and they were called barracks rats and they didn't want to get out. You know, a lot of them didn't be there. Now I'm talking about the years of the draft too. Yeah. So you knew, you know, didn't you, you didn't want to be there. And they were in a strange country again, you know, not all the, the people, not all that nation, nation wanted them there out on their economy. They didn't want them dating their daughters or, you know, using going to their locations, living in their their houses. So a lot of them would stay in the barracks and of course 
one thing leads to another, and there were a lot of problems that we helped address through our tour program, through our entertainment programs, and it was wonderful to see young soldiers, young military families that could not afford to go out on the economy. The mark was very, very, we did not get a lot of marks for our dollars, and we took them on these trips, and I'm so glad to say that it, that USO, this was US, USO Mannheim, won an award for all of USOs for our tours and to we tied it in with learning the culture, learning okay. to get around the, the country, learning to maybe even speak a little bit of the language and so I'm very proud of that award which is probably somewhere over in Germany but it really helped, it helped their morale. We took them on educational trips, how to shop on the economy, how to use a Strassenbahn. And you know, this goes on in all of our countries, even in Korea, you know, where they had the first Korean wives program because a lot of our soldiers were marrying Koreans and the spouses and you know, it was a big, big cultural change when and if they came to the U.S. So, you know, a lot of things that people don't think of USO, they may think of the entertainment, which is very important. I mean, I saw Bob Hope three and four times. I was on the ship, the Iwo Jima, with him when we did a show up in New York Harbor. And that was very good to see them come in. And I know I've heard from others. We've, I, when I was in Kuwait, we had Kelly Pickler come over. And of course, she's a popular star now. And the troops just absolutely went crazy. And it's not the fact that it's a big star. It was the fact that somebody came right to support them and to show appreciation. So it was kind of bringing uh, a piece of America to our servicemen and servicewomen. And that's, that's so, you know, makes me feel very proud and happy about that. And most importantly, it's the feeling that I get is when a soldier, sailor, Marine, airman, Coast Guard says to me, thank you or says thanks to our volunteer. And it's so heartfelt and we want to say no, no, we want to thank you. This is what we're for. We don't have to be here. We want to be here. And, you know, it's been amazing to me is, you know, received a lot of awards, which I don't think, you know, it's for the organization, not for me. But, you know, it was just it was just something that I'm very proud of. And I think a very a lot of the moments there that I, mean, I was just able to help a family, maybe even to get a visa to get on a plane, because when you're overseas, the USO is America. That's your part of America, whatever station or whatever country that you're in. Many of the times that, that our organization's been here, particularly during the period when uh, things are pretty active in the Middle East, soldiers would, would get here and for one reason or another, they'd lose a family member or uh, um, have some sort of an administrative problem, and we just sent them to you folks. I mean, definitely. What, what? There were definitely, there was everything we see, and this is very common, lost luggage, lost visa, do not have the correct paperwork. You know, this Atlanta Airport USO is really just like a, its own little mini organization within the military because one of the unique things that happens at this USO Center is that every single day, young women and women from around the world. Guam arrives at 7.30 a.m. They come here, they're young, they're 18 years old. They've never been away from home. Some of them have never flown before. And they come to the USO and they're supposed to be going to Fort Benning or Fort Jackson, where am I? How do I get there? I'm supposed to get a bus. Who's here to meet me, et cetera? Do I, am I in the right place? And you know, they're, they're scared. They're anxious, spend the whole days with us. It's that USO volunteer helping to assure them, yes, we will send you down to the right location where you will catch that bus. You'll be on your way and don't be frightened. This is how it's going to work. And you know, it's, it, it, there, you see a sigh of relief. And it, the same thing 14 weeks later, which you're, you're always here, I think on graduation day, you see many of them come back and you know, when they're going, you think, 
I don't know if they're going to make it. You really want to cross it. And the last thing we say, see you when you graduate. Good luck. And then when those that come back and have graduated, it's, hi, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Do you remember me? Hi, sir. Do you remember me? Of course we remember you. We knew you would make it. And you, as an American, would be so proud to see the enthusiasm, the self-confidence that they have, and their willingness to serve their country, the self-assurance. It's a Whole world of difference. I know the military is not meant to be a social economic uh, area for education, but it really does a wonderful job for many who may not have even had that chance. Talk a little bit about what you do around the holidays. Well, during the holidays, of course, we're Operation Holiday, where we provide holiday meals and holiday baskets for our troops and their families, especially for those in need. But our biggest operation is called Operation Holiday Block Leave, or formerly Operation Exodus. And this is the largest non formal move, military movement of troops. We have up to 10,000 young men and young women that come through our USO during a three-day period. It's a 24-hour cycle. They need assistance. They need uh, transportation. They need uh, food. They need lodging assistance. And they're going supposedly home on two weeks. And what goes out comes back. But not everybody has a home to go to. And so we ended up trying to get lodging for them for two weeks, getting food and refreshments for them two weeks. Also entertainment for the troops that are left behind at the local bases. We have tickets to hopefully the to sports games that are still in the, in the series. We take them to the Symphony, Stone Mountain, various locations. And it, it's just truly a time. Again, we depend on the volunteers to do this on a 24-hour site for three to four days and then it happens again on January 1st it's a new year we have the New Year buffet they're coming back and again you have some of the problems I lost my luggage I lost my paperwork and sometimes they lose their uniforms and I will tell you this I'm going to tell you this is sometimes there's a lot of ingenuity we had a young man I'll never forget this and he came up and of course the drill sergeants are here to get them on the buses etc and things and um, he came and I heard the drill sergeant what is that and I looked he had lost his tie and he was in his green uniform he bought a belt and made a tie out of his belt. Well, I when I saw that, I knew. I mean, the the sergeant, you get down, you know. So we have to, you know, bite our tongues. We know that, you know, they're responsible to getting them back safely, and that's very important because some will wander off, some will miss the bus, they'll get on the wrong bus, and so it it was interesting. But that that was that was probably the the one time that I saw that, and the and the other servicemen that only wore his trench coat because where is where is my uniform my dog ate it and so when you you have to you have to listen to this and you, you can't say because you know they're not telling it to you when they tell it to us we tell them okay well maybe you won't you don't want to say that but you know when they're telling it directly and we overhear it to the drill sergeant then it makes a, a different different uh, chance you sound yeah. like you enjoy this I mean, you really well I guess I do after 49 years like I said it's become a mission field a lifestyle um, it is something that is easily it's it's not a job people say what would you be doing I, I would just I would just be doing this it's my chance to say thank you to the men and women who are serving our country I'm representing the home front I'm representing the organization but when I'm representing the organization I'm representing the citizens of the community that want to say thank you to show their appreciation and you know it's a lifeblood of of the community and I think it's needed I would hope that it would never go away because it is an avenue for Americans and other citizens to show their support for the men and women you, of the Air Force. Do you get a, a lot of support from the community in, for your various endeavors? In the Atlanta community, we're very, and in, in our Savannah community and War, in Warner Robins. Not always so, as I said, but it, it's just tremendous. And just recently, we had, you know, the 4th of July, and people tend to, to look upon us as, you know, the honoring our troops. And I think that's what's become 
known. I think USO can rightfully say that we are America's military charity, the charity that really represents America, support for the men and women of the armed forces. So, you know, it's, as I said, it's something that I just really, really love doing. Oh. When did you come to Atlanta? What year? I came to Atlanta in 40, almost 40 years ago. So in uh, the late 60s, early 70s? In the 70s. 70s. Yeah, we okay. just had our 40th anniversary, okay. yes. So what was that like? I mean, what position were you I, in charge? I, I came to see, as I said, what the, what the problem was. Uh, it was the end of the Vietnam War. There was a USO on Lucky Street, hmm. no funding. At that time, they were funded by United Way. There was no more funding. The community did not want to fund it. They didn't think there was a need. They didn't think there was a purpose. So it closed down, and there was an office in what is now CNN Center, but it was the Omni then. And I came in, and, and I looked around, and I thought, wow, what are we supposed to be doing? And uh, went through the files, and in the meantime, I started looking around. We were at the military entrance processing station downtown, which is now a very, very big project for USO. I'll get into that a little later on. And then um, came to the airport where all these young women were going into the service because at that time only, Fort, only the women were only trained at Fort Jackson. Okay. And they would have to come to Atlanta, as they still do, for a three and a half hour ride. They were not being taken care of. There were some terrible things that happened. They got in taxis in one places, and we had just begun our USO airport pro, uh, program. Like I said, the first one was in Frankfurt, Germany, where I did meet General Dempsey when he was then a, a first lieutenant. And so um, looked into that, and they said, oh, we could really use help. Uh, here we have all these young, men, young women coming in. So we moved in very quickly to the airport downstairs in the old terminal, and we had a um, a little room and then we expanded because not only then were they sending them to Fort Jackson, they started sending them to Fort Benning for infantry school. So we had men and women. Mm -hmm. And just recently, you know, women have been coming to uh, Fort Benning for, for school. So that's how it started. And one thing led to the other. Then there was an explosion of just military travel. The, you know, the war, uh, the Gulf War again came on. And then during Operation Enduring Freedom, where we were the coordination point for all of the R&R the R &R flights through here, you know, two million during the 10 years uh, during Operation R&R. &R. Would you describe for whoever may see this what that was like, you know, uh, what the process was? Operation R&R &R was the, the program by which military men and women serving in combat were granted a two-week R&R period to come back to the States during their year of combat overseas, mostly in Afghanistan and Iraq. And so they, they would come in on a chartered flight every, you name it, any time during the day or night. It could have been 2 a.m. in the morning, could have been 2 uh, p.m. in the afternoon. And USO would be there with our volunteers to meet them, to greet them, to give them those phone cards if they needed to call, to provide the phones, to provide the meals, to get them if they needed a shower, to, uh, sh ferrying them over to some of the hotel rooms, to unite them with their family and to get them on to their next destination because not all of them were staying here. However, all of them had to return here to catch the flight going back. And again, that's where they would come. They would come in at all hours of the morning. We, and the flight did not leave until 10, 11 at night. We would feed them, the volunteers would feed them. Our USO would be there for providing recreation, providing again those phone calls, which were very sad to listen to when they're calling, you know, oh yes, daddy loves you. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna miss your birthday. And then even seeing those families, some families came with them to be with them to the last minute they got on and to see a child tugging at their, you know, the knee of their father or their mother. I mean, it, it, was, it was really very, you know, wrenching, but we were glad that we were able to provide that space and even a quiet space for some that, that wanted to be alone. And you know, uh, we also were here for the families of the fallen. 
that's a program that we have where you know the troops that are killed not only in combat because we just had that recent right. training accident uh, both in the Pacific on the USS Fitzgerald and the, the marine helicopter this past week and you know those young men and young women uh, their remains are usually flown to Dover and that family gets the knock on the door to uh, that there has been a disaster, there's been a tragedy, and they have maybe five to ten minutes to get whatever they need, because the military has, has arranged for their flight, to get them up to Dover to see that transfer of remains. And, and they want to do that. They definitely want to do it. Well, the families come, you know, some forgot their glasses, some don't have the right socks, some are just, you know, in, in uh, just in shock. And our volunteers are there well, with how them. How do you find out that they're coming? We get we get word. Okay, so we you get word officially from we, the service. We get a word from our Dover. Okay, Dover. Our USO at Dover is the site. You know, there. Okay. I hate to say the mortuary, but we have a USO there, and uh, the family of the fallen program. Yes, and sometimes we get words word directly, especially from Japan. They'll call us a lot from Japan when there's somebody coming from the Pacific, and then. Many times the remains come through here, and there's the you know the ceremony, and our volunteers are down there to show their respect, and it, it's very very moving, and uh, you know it's it's something that you know it's just part of the whole program that USO, mainly here at at Hartsville, I could say we see everything, from you know a family that needs help um, today. Do you have any diapers? Or, um, I, yeah, I think you were there. We were looking for diapers because, and we do carry diapers, baby food, formula. You know, you know, it's not only a single person. It's the family there serves a too. A lot of families, a lot of families PCSing or going to new duty stations, and so you know they need that. And you know, again, they recognize that USO is home to them, and it, it's you know their little place for support. And you know it, it's you know I've seen it. I've handed out coffee and cokes in the the mud in Hockenheim, Germany, uh, working out of a tent. And when they would do, I think it was called Reforger, yeah. Operation yeah. Reforger, and you know the trucks would come in, and we were handing out the cokes, handing out the coffee, and you know they're going out in the field and everything like that. And then on the the flight lines for the deploying troops and uh, at. Hunter Army Airfield when they're they're going and I don't know how many times we saw them go up there and, and when they go they're in combat gear and, and you know and in in that really strikes strikes you know a feeling in you and the USO care packages are there packed by loving hands and so it's just been remarkable when you look over the organization you think oh wow I'm not responsible for this, but I'm glad that I had a part in sort of getting it together, leading it, and you know, showing what what the organization is. And the organization are the vol is the volunteers. There are the volunteers, are they? Yeah, but I mean, the uh, I'm part of one of the organizations that volunteers here, and the response from the troops and the families is just tremendous. It's, you covered it a little earlier. I mean, it's just oh, a yes. heartfelt. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't know how many times I heard thank you today as they were going by. This is great. Thank you for doing this. And especially the new, you know, I mentioned earlier MAPS, Military Entrance Processing Station. USO has that big push now that we want to be in every MAPS. In fact, the MAPS commander was here last night. We were meeting with her because we've provided a, a foosball table for her. We provide the magazines and we provide some snacks, but they're redoing their, their location. So we'll be over there, you know, once they reopen. They, they're still uh, open, but they're not a large space, and the families come with them, and it's a great place to introduce USO or the life of a military. You know, these people are coming, none of them, very few of them, what, 1% of our population serve in the armed forces. So it's it's new to them also, you know, what does that mean? Where do they go? Will they be taken care of? And, you know, that's a great introduction to them, and, and then they come here, and, you know, they come for all the services here. Our Marines and our, our at our USO in Savannah 
uh, that's where all the Marines to Paris Island go for training, and and that's very very interesting too. When you see when when they come back, you know the Marines Before have a after. yeah the Marines have a big red, white, and blue bus, and you know they're coming out, and you know when they graduate, it's really really a, you know a big deal as it is with the with the soldiers. I mean, yeah. if you ever been to a graduation at Fort Benning, and they're so proud, we we get very excited on graduation day because we have seen. How could you say? Maybe we have seen an end result, and you know, hopefully we had something to do with it. You know, by giving them that pat on the back, good luck. We'll see you when you graduate. Let us know, and they do. They'll tell you. They'll say. And of course, you know, we have gifts for them. We give them the ear, the earbuds, and candy, which they hadn't had, and, and let them choose their candy that they want. And you heard when they we said chili dogs today. Oh yeah, where are the chili dogs? And that's the famous. Speaking thing. of food, I know sometimes you have restaurants that provide hot meals for these folks. Can you talk a little bit about yes, that? Yes, we have. Oh, we had a re alliance with the Chefs Association and still have some with a chef from Eastlake Golf Club, Vincenzo's Restaurant, the Atlanta Culinary School. Just last week we had Lenox Square bring some of their restaurants over to serve lunch with them. So we provide various events and uh, catered meals. Some of the, the uh, Churches will provide food, barbecue, Chick-fil-A is a great supplier, and we have everything from lasagna to baked spaghetti, barbecue, <clears throat> barbecue is a favorite. And of course, I can't thank the Kroger people enough for their support. Yeah, mention that, uh, that you were, the Kro you and the Kroger are working together for... Uh... Honoring our heroes. Right. <clears throat> And excuse me, and isn't that great to call them heroes? And so every year for the past five years, Kroger has a Honor Our Heroes campaign where they ask their customers to round it up with their, their bill to support the USO. And this year, the campaign's two weeks long. We also get our volunteers very much involved. And I will tell you again, uh, the Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association very much in the forefront, especially for two of our stores, and they really, really support the goal. In fact, the store that they were supporting came in number one, Dunwoody Club Drive, and so it, it helps us, and it's a campaign that's national, so we get some proceeds of the money and some of the funds go overseas to, you know, to definitely fund Afghanistan and Iraq. We're back in Iraq again, USO, Kuwait. So um, the funds are spread out, but Kroger is a, a, a large partner, as is, you know, I'm, while we're talking about Atlanta, let me, let me plan. Coca-Cola was our first USO supporter worldwide, and they're still our continuous supporter. And the Coca-Cola company is definitely, if you look around, you'll see our Coca-Cola artifacts. This flag was, it was part of the series that they donated to us. Coca-Cola beverages all over the place, complimentary. We had the Coca-Cola bear here one time. And the Coca-Cola bear will come during the holidays and uh, give out special event things. And we even have a Coca-Cola USO bottle. I don't know if you saw that, but we had it during our our, uh, our anniversary. And Lockheed Martin is another uh, another great yeah. supporter. Yes, so we're very fortunate in that, but that doesn't mean everything is taken care of. Right. We still have to let the people know through our Facebook and through, you know, just general awareness. And that's not only what the campaigns do, they make the country aware that USO is still there. But again, do you know, recently someone at a Kroger store said, I didn't know that we still had servicemen and servicewomen serving. When, you know, the war is not on the front page, and thank God it's not on there yeah. now, because we used to see that all the time, people forget. And our mission is not to make them it. The mission of USO is to strengthen America's military servicemen by connecting them to their family, to the country, to the, and their home throughout their service to the nation. And that's what we do by any means, by serving them, by awareness, you know, by talking about it just like I am now. You, as the, the uh, CEO of the, the Council of Georgia, you pretty much act like an ambassador in many cases. Where, where, what are some of the things you do in the course of representing the USO? 
Well, of course, funding, but also representing yourself in the community. And I have a great board, the USO Consul of Georgia, and great volunteers. And, you know, we have to be at United Way. We have to be with the city. The city provides the, the rent for us, uh, pro, uh, going out to the corporations that are corporate partners, Coca-Cola, being involved with other civic organizations. Our AUSA, the Navy League, the Veterans Program, you know, the wonderful Veterans Program that's every year down in November 11th with the parade. This past year, you know, USO was the honoree. We were the, the Grand Marshal of the parade. We had General yeah, Harry and, and just did a wonderful, wonderful General Casey. George Casey did was the honorary Grand Marshal. He was a speaker and, you know, at the event. So there's a lot of things that we must do out in the front, always talking about the USO. But even though I do that, I love being here with the troops, I think, as you may well know. It gives you that feeling. Doesn't it give you that wonderful feeling of, of doing something? And I, I haven't had a volunteer, and I think ever, say, I'm never coming back. This is not not for me. Yeah. It's always the opposite. It's, it's it, an enjoyable, it's a fun experience to mm -hmm. interact with them. Because they are quality people. They really are. They are. And, you know, you say, say that, you know, what you do. Many times, you know, I was down at the, the counter welcoming them back home because you just, it's just something that you wanted to, to do. And so many people say to me, oh, I wish I had your job. And I thought, oh, yeah, th they think that's all I do. And I think, well, <laughs> you know, but, but yes, yes, and it, but it is an honor to do that. But I thought, oh, I got to go up now and do the minutes or I got to go and see how the budget is, is going to be taken. And, uh, and of course, we have to network with our military, our military partners, the National Guard. We just had General Joe Giroux here to be here for our 40th anniversary so we have to you know network with them find out what their needs are I mean we just can't go in a, a vacuum and think oh I think we should do this for the troops sometimes we get um, you know request like for maybe USO shows or Operation Vigilant Guard which we just did down in Perry Georgia the National Guard came to us and said we have thousands coming in we're going to be at another location remote location what can you do we went down we brought our mobile canteen we we set up you know inside we brought the refreshments we brought the care packages you know some uh, things that they can do some board games etc we're ready we're an expeditionary force we've got USO on the go if we need it we went to Hurricane Katrina who were the first boots on the ground USO Georgia we took a, a, a canteen from USO world we were down there we set up in the in Mobile Alabama at the Aviation Coast Guard location and served troops from all over to include our own Georgia National Guard we we're there with General Honore we even held a USO show down there we brought uh, some of the people down there there and I'm trying to think who is the gentleman oh I, I think can't think of his name right now he'll never forgive me the one in Las Vegas oh. uh, you know Wayne Newton. <laughs> Wayne Newton. Yeah. We brought Wayne Newton down and he you know performed a show for us down there in the Mississippi Delta. Mm -hmm. That's good that's that's interesting I don't think a lot of people realize what the USO is. No but you know on the other hand too you know what's so good about that we get calls all the time. Oh, the USO will do this. Call the USO. They'll help you. And you're, we're amazed because we have that reputation, and that's what's hard when it's really not our, our purview. And you're thinking, oh, wow, you know. Oh, yeah, the USO will help you. Go to the USO. I don't even, you probably heard it a million times down there when you were at the counter during, during all the time that you've been this wonderful volunteer. Oh, go to the USO. They'll help you. And so oh, it's hard to say when you can. But, you know, there's some things we cannot do. I think we just had a case out there where he was a homeless, and he wasn't even a a military veteran and he was just looking for you know a place to stay yeah. so we re we work with other agencies that's important the networking that you said oh yeah we need to we definitely need to network with other organizations we need to know what's available there's no sense you know reinventing the wheel if we could do it you know and collaboration is what what it's all about you've really done quite a job here I mean I'm, I've been involved with, with volunteering in the USO now for I don't know how many years, several years, and uh, it's a pleasure to come here. It well, really is. Well, we want it to be a first-class operation. We think they deserve the best. I get, sometimes I'll get pinged because, what do you mean you don't want my used lazy boy? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. We're not, we're not a second hand, and you know, I don't mean to be, 
nothing but the best for our servicemen and servicewomen. You know, it, they deserve the best. And um, even to the point, you know, that we won't take dirty old raggedy uh, books. I'm sorry. Come on. Let, this is, we're showing our appreciation. You know, we're not cast off. We want the best for them. And it takes time. But, you know, that's what it's all about. And we're proud of this location. We're proud of all our, our centers. Our USO at Fort Stewart is going to be one of the best. It's uh, probably will be opening in November, but the plans are just absolutely. And, you know, one of the things I do want to talk about is we'll have our transition center there for the servicemen and servicewomen. You know what, we have 10000 a year mm -hmm. going from the, leaving the service, at least at this point, at this time, and, you know, helping them write a resume, get how to do a job interview. So we're setting up a transition center, pathfinding center down there. It'll be part of the USO Center at Fort Stewart, which will be very modern. We're even going to have a, a kitchen, testing kitchen, to help the families and the servicemen learn how to eat well or learn how to correct, cook their food so they don't always have to eat all junk food. Are these going to be, is it going to be manned by professional people? Or oh, yes. Volunteers? No, well, there's going to be volunteers there, too. One of my, um, we've already hired her, Regina. She's down there already. In fact, I just got an, uh, an uh, video. I don't know if I showed you this one. It just came in. It was, we just did it. Kroger. Yeah. yeah, Kroger did a big uh, barbecue down at, for 2,000. We served 2,000 on the Army birthday, June 14th down there. And then we celebrated the Army birthday. And we had a Rodney Atkins concert down there. And uh, so that's to kick off to show that we're going to be at Fort Stewart. It was right at Fort Stewart, Newman Field, and it was it went over great. So everybody's saying, "Now, now, where's USO? What are we going to be doing?" So they're really, you know, looking for that. You know, how many troops Georgia has? I mean, and how many veterans, et cetera, that are here? It's it's you know a lot. We're also is you know getting on that theme of the transition. On August second, we will be uh, holding a job fair with our partner. Hiring Heroes USA, they're the Chamber of Commerce, and some of your Atlanta AVBBA people are going to be helping me. They're going to be some of our volunteers there with the registration up at the SunTrust Park. So there, there are a lot of things that are going on. You know, we do have what we call collaborative partners, and I'm talking about USO. We have Stronger Families, Sesame Street for Military Children, where we put on workshops for them to help them, you know, identify with other military children, stronger families, to help reintegrate the families when they come back from deployment. It's usually run by a chaplain. And then, of course, Hiring Heroes USA. So there's a lot of things that go on that we work with other agencies that are under USO, collaborate yeah. with. I mean, I, I didn't realize how extensive the USO umbrella was. I mean, I. I've been involved here and some other things, but not quite. The yeah, well, we're not just coffee and donuts, <laughs> see? And we, you know, but not to say that coffee and donuts aren't important. When you're out in the field, what do you want? Coffee and donuts. And what do a lot of people come here? They want, they, they want their, you know, field. Yeah, we're, you know, it does. And, you know, how about our, you know, I mentioned our entertainment. But entertainment goes down to, on the, the local level, tickets to events. Mm -hmm. We send tickets, to, we provide tickets to the games. You know, we just did a big military appreciation day at uh, the Atlanta Braves in May. Where I had 150 volunteers, USO volunteers, spread out the, the the big flag on the field, and they wanted it to be for USO volunteers. So again, that to me showed appreciation for what the organization uh, did. So, you know, it's uh, the Braves are a local partner this year with us, providing ticket vouchers for the troops. They even provided care packages for the troops. So it's just... That's great. And I will tell you that next week we'll be having 500 starting to deploy out of Hunter Army Airfield. Our volunteers that are here today will be taking some of the supplies down for them. And I'll be down there at least for one of the deployments because I said that is, you know, you never get out of tired of seeing them where they're going and, you know, wishing them Godspeed. Well, this has really been enjoyable. Uh, the last thing we do in these interviews is give you an opportunity to just editorialize, to speak, make any comments you wish about any subject you wish. Is there well, anything you'd... Well, I would, of course, I want to say about USO and how I got involved. It was to help, and I really felt that kept me going. It's a variety of roles. Every day is different. Every situation is different, except for your clientele. 
the men and women of the armed forces. And as I said, it started out as a job. It became a lifestyle. I met my husband because of it. Uh, interesting, he uh, evicted me from my office when he moved his command down from Kaiserslautern to Mannheim and wanted that office for one of his troops or someone. And so I got back at him in a way you would say that. He's got a roommate for life. And so, uh, it, it, you know, and it just went on. And, you know, there were times that I guess I could have started. Times that were difficult at times. Uh, raised a child uh, through it and who became very, very much a volunteer. Volunteers at another USO in another state now. But, you know, as I said, it's the reason, the whole mission behind it. I don't feel like I'm a do-gooder. There are times that you think, oh, I don't know, really think that was the right thing to do or the right person to help. But it's the whole basic. Uh, I'm, no, I'm no more patriotic or red, white, and blue than any other person. It's just something that I feel needs to be done. I have the means through the organization, and that's the organization that really should get the honor. So I thank you for allowing me to do this. No, uh, I said it. it's been a lifestyle. I've got mementos, you know, but what do you do then? You think, ah, oh, just the fact that somebody remembered me, came back, and now in the case of General Dempsey serving two generations, don't think I'll be around to serve three, but, uh, you know, it's, it's just something that you, that you remember. Yeah. Well, we appreciate, as a former active duty service person, we appreciate what you did for us and what you do for these folks every day. And uh, thank you. Well, thank you. And you know, who knows? We may have passed, you and I, at, at various things during, during the Vietnam War. Maybe I met you at one of those places in, in Washington, D.C. As I said, that you, you can't say Vietnam is, a, is your war or, because I did not serve there, but it was my generation. Yeah. Well, again, thank you very much. We really appreciate you. Well, thank you. you. Thank you. Did you? Just a couple of quick questions, if you don't mind. Mary. Sure. Who were your funders in the early years during the Vietnam War? Okay, Coca-Cola always was consistent. Um, during the Vietnam War, um, Lockheed Martin, they were uh, some of the defense industries. Okay. Um, Rockwell, but I think Rockwell has gone out of uh, mm -hmm. out of business in BAE systems. Okay. Primarily, that was it. And we used to do galas. I didn't mention that, but we used to have to do galas and fundraisers. Uh -huh. And uh, that's why I used to get Bob Hope in town, especially in Chicago, <laughs> and working with him. He was he was really great, and you know, just on uh, fundraisers on that. But the, basically, it, it was it was tough overseas because you didn't have that, you had to depend on what your budget was. Yeah. And that, you know, you got a budget, but you, you weren't getting any funding because you couldn't, you didn't want to charge the troops or anything like that. So it was a little bit difficult. In the state side, it was pretty, pretty tough getting, getting the funding. Now, there were some countries that really put in a lot of money. Kuwait put in, uh, uh, I think, a million dollars, Korea. Korea was very, because let's think of, you know, our DMZ, you know, I've been to Korea, I know how bad it, you know, it is up there, and uh, they put in a lot of funding. And the Korean War veterans are, are probably great, great supporters, as, you know, some of our board members are of Korean ancestry, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's changed. Um, Kroger would be a new one, like I said, in the last five years. Again, when you're getting back into the mainstream funding, and, you know, like I said, it was defense industry. So, who, who was everybody against yeah. during that time? Yeah. Guns and you know, not butter, you know. And just one last question: mm -hmm. If you you've talked about some great experiences, if you had to pick one experience where you were personally involved with helping a service member or a service member's family that sticks out over your career, could you pick one? Yes, because I I don't know why I could still see him to this day, and he ha he was married to a third country national, and we were in Germany, and we were in my office down there, and he was just a little bit beside himself. He was leaving, and his wife could not leave. She did not have the papers, and uh, we worked with him. I brought him to uh, some of the offices and everything, and her, and, and you know, when it finally he was able to get the papers, he came in himself to thank me. And I almost cried. He almost be crazy because his words were, thank you 
you helped me when nobody else would. Mm -hmm. And that just melted me. And I just remember him. I could see him standing there. I, and I can't remember his name. And he was down there. And he came down. My office was down in the basement under the American Express in Germany. And he came in to say, thank you. And the words were, you helped him when nobody else would. Wow. Well, as a former Navy wife, who mm -hmm. found a USO at a foreign airport where I could let my toddler lay down. Huh? <laughs> thank you. For well, all thank you. Was so it okay? <laughs> no, great. All right. Good. Were, you, were you comfortable? That's really what we try to get to. That was oh, do I talk too fast? Great. I guess. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess that's me. I'm. That's. I'm so. You know. That was again. a great interview. Oh, well, thank you. I am really excited about this. Thank you so much for taking the time to do it. I know your schedule is just insane.